Hi everyone, CJ here. In this episode of Open the World Map, we are going to talk to Malaysian tabletop gaming blogger Kai. We talked about Malaysian's tabletop gaming habits and also the fledgling tabletop gaming industry in Malaysia. If you are interested in the culture and also want to hear some insight on the challenges faced by a smaller international tabletop gaming company, then this is going to be an interesting episode for you. I'm Kai. I live in Shah Alam, uh, the capital of Selangor State in Malaysia, and I mostly do gaming around the Petaling Jaya, Shah Alam, and Kuala Lumpur area. That's a big Klang Valley area, which is about uh, probably about the size, uh, similar in size, well, similar in population to, say, the greater Los Angeles area, but twice the population density. Um, and that is where a lot of the role players who get together face to face are. A lot of people who don't end up having to go online and so on. But anyway, I'm a gamer, a blogger, a writer. I've been a game designer for computer games and some uh, uh, tabletop stuff. And uh, I run the blog, uh, rolloverplaydead.com, an outpost in a Malaysian gaming scene. Okay, yeah, thanks for that. It's a great introduction. Do people uh, play Dungeons & Dragons in Malaysia? Or is there a more popular tabletop RPG in Malaysia? Dungeons and Dragons is the most popular RPG in Malaysia, and D and uh, D has been played in Malaysia since the early days. I started with the basic expert set uh, series, you know, the original Red Box, and D and D was played back then. D and D did well with third edition and fourth edition, but it's only really exploded with fifth edition, which has added a lot of new players. And part of that is because we had some guys set up an adventurer's league locally and really work hard to run public games at comic shops, uh, card game shops, and uh, even miniature, uh, tabletop miniature uh, shops in Malaysia. So we had, for a couple of years, from 2015 to 2016, a very active adventurer's league, and you could go to uh, various shops in the Klang Valley area and actually drop in on a certain night and there would be an open game you could join. And so there were times when 10, even 11 people would be joining into one game with a uh, dungeon master because they wanted to try this out. There were some people who were who used to play in the old days back in college when they were playing third edition or AD and D who got back into it because there were these open games. And that has helped to spread D and D a lot. There are a lot of RPGs, but D and D fifth edition has really exploded. Okay, well that's great. Uh, that's really good to hear. And so, all right, so it's really Adventurous League that's really popularizing, popularizing it, isn't it? And well, it was until 2016. Um, I mean, I think you probably know that uh, Wizards of the Coast changed their volunteer program. They stopped having volunteers entirely at the end of 2016. And Adventurous League was run by these other organizations instead. And so in a lot of countries like Malaysia, where it only depended on, depended only on the volunteer program, that was the end of official support. So um, the people who were doing Adventurous League, some of them have continued doing uh, D&D, some of them have continued doing the official campaigns uh, and getting stuff from DM Guild. But um, at the same time, a large portion of those people also set up RPG My, a role-playing role player, role player, role gamers union of Malaysia on Facebook, because uh, we use Facebook to organize uh, Adventurous League as well. And together with some other local RPG organizations and groups, um, they organize and they play a wide range of games, and they've kept the whole thing moving along. And in fact, on my blog, in the future, I'll be interviewing one of the people in charge of Adventurous League and the Role-Playing Gamers Union and talking about the details of what goes on here. So if your viewers are interested, you should check out my blog in the near future. When I say that D&D for Edition exploded, I meant publicly and on the internet, I mean, the group has, uh, the the uh, D&D Malaysia uh, Facebook group has over a thousand members, which is a lot for Malaysia's uh, tabletop scene. You get more people who might be playing Magic the Gathering, but they're not as social and not as engaged. You get a lot of people spending more money on Warhammer 40,000. But again, uh, if you want to talk about social engagement, people uh, writing fiction about their uh, characters, drawing art, and getting together, D&D still has the most engagement. So a thousand members on the Facebook group, on the Facebook group, you know, that's an indication. But keep in mind that, you know, 
dozens of people were playing uh, on the, the nights uh, when they had public games. But the vast majority of people who role play in Malaysia will have to role play from home or in their own uh, venues that they set up, like their own little clubs and so on. Um, and not so much in these public venues. Adventurous League is a small portion. And it's just that it was a very public face that made people aware, hey, I saw this on Facebook. My friend is playing Adventurous League. I didn't know D&D was still going on. And so it got a lot of people sort of in this avalanche effect, coming into the RPG scene, uh, being reminded because there was a public face at the stores, and that's always been important. Even if, you know, it's just a smaller portion playing Adventurous League. But it's a people great who, advertising, isn't it? Yeah, even though a lot of people turn out to be playing at home. And, and yeah, and it encouraged other groups to become more organized. Uh, I was with a group called Gamers of Kale for many years, and uh, they we, we didn't really organize a lot by ourselves compared by with uh, uh, Adventurous League. So it's great to have, you know, to have had that energy and momentum. Uh, they encouraged the Pathfinder guys who took a Pathfinder after 3rd edition to start a Pathfinder Society in Malaysia. And that's still going along. There's a couple of game masters who keep uh, in touch with uh, Paizo and getting material, although they are not so fond of pa Pathfinder 2nd edition. But that's another story. So yeah, there's, there's a... It, it encouraged uh, the gamers to come out. Okay, well, that's that's really interesting to know. And, uh, you know, with uh, Dungeons & Dragons being the most popular uh, tabletop role-playing game there, do you know what sort of other tabletop RPGs do people play? Because uh, as, you know, I've been speaking to people from, uh, you know, uh, Chinese-speaking territories like uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong, apparently, like, Japan, uh, the top tabletop RPG for them is Call of Cthulhu. And I don't know, uh, there might be a connection that I haven't really discovered why, but, but you know, is Call of Cthulhu or other games popular in Malaysia too? I love Call of Cthulhu, and I know a bunch of guys who play it. It's not near the top, but, you know, there's more than one group uh, playing it at a time, whether it's Call of Cthulhu or related games like Trail of Cthulhu, Cthulhu Dark, uh, Delta Green, there are people who play it. After Dungeons and Dragons, uh, way below that will be um, the people who used to play D and D and still want to play, get, have that experience, but they don't get it from fifth edition, or they prefer to stay with something else. So you have Pathfinder, where a lot of people from third edition moved to. A lot of people who played fourth edition and loved it, like me and my friends, moved to thirteenth age or to 5th edition, because 5th edition has uh, enough in common and you can find players really easily. Um, when we did a very informal survey, we found that if you take Vampire the Masquerade, the various World of Darkness, uh, Chronicles of Darkness, Vampire the Requiem, Werewolf the Apocalypse, uh, Mage, you take all those White Wolf um, World of Darkness games, that may make the second largest uh, slice of the pie but that's from an informal survey of uh, dozens of people who were on this one group but yeah after dnd all those vampire world of darkness games you have people playing in college you have people who are just interested because it's a completely different experience from dnd instead of a specialist going into a dungeon you have what i call katanas and tea parties people who could do a lot of violence but end up being invited to the prince's court to do diplomacy or to negotiate between different factions and uh, which and that's the kind of thing that uh, is is a, at a much lower secondary level, but it's there. After that, you get games which are known because they're tied into media properties. The Star Wars RPGs, like Edge of the Empire, although there's a guy who's been playing Star Wars D6 since forever back then, and he's up in Perlis, uh, and that's a really interesting story. Um, there's the Warhammer RPGs, uh, including Warhammer Fantasy and... Dark Heresy, Rogue Trader, all those RPGs, and the new Warhammer 40,000 RPG is going to be to have a share of audience. Similarly, there was a Legend of the Five Rings card game community for a while in a few of the comic shops here, and so you had people from that group and also just role players who wanted to play Samurai playing Legend of the Five Rings, and some of them are interested in the new edition of the card game and the RPG as well. So as far as the, um, the licensed uh, games, those are pretty popular. Okay, well, it, that's that's great to hear. So it's like really you guys play everything over there, isn't it? 
it's if it's well, published you play because is it because like um a lot of people speak english in malaysia or it's is it like one of the official language in malaysia yeah uh next to singapore malaysia has the highest uh, english uh language proficiency in southeast asia uh and they teach english in schools it's declined a little bit but a lot of people still speak english so there's a certain demographic in malaysia i mean we're still of course a tiny niche like in a lot of countries um and in this tiny niche you find that a lot of people who are urban city dwellers english speaking who buy and read books more often and especially in uh, the last 20 years people on the internet they are uh, have the exposure and the opportunity to play so you have people who studied overseas but increasingly you have people who are here but they get online and they find out about stuff and again with the advent of fifth edition and streaming and podcast and shows like critical role that has exploded again because you have people who haven't even gone to a game session and haven't played in overseas colleges or so on but find, found out about it because of these streaming shows and watching D&D games for the first time so that has really exploded role playing but again one of the things which we don't like to brag about but it's true in Malaysia as much as other countries but it's sort of a tradition is piracy so when i was young there were photocopied manuals uh oh one person has the expert set but now multiple people have expert set copies that they photocopied and then with the internet uh there were editions of D&D where there were never any PDFs at the time but somehow there would be people coming with their laptop to a session and they had access to all the different feats and prestige classes they needed to play D&D in third edition and it got to a point where some of the uh, store owners made it a point no you got to bring the real book your laptop doesn't count that's piracy but because of but because of the high internet penetration rate and uh, malaysia also has a very high rate of people on social media like facebook and twitter there is a lot of people who get you know access to role playing because they find out about it online and they download stuff that's interesting and now because of drive through rpg and more recently dnd beyond you can buy the official pdfs and not feel guilty about it and not get store owners pissed off a lot of people uh, started going into uh, tabletop rpg dungeons and dragons through critical role and i think it becomes a point of reference for them you know, how to role play and so on but if, uh, do uh, but you know do malaysians role play a bit differently because you know um you know I, they like absorb a lot of media from around the world pretty much uh, hollywood films and like uh, like Hercules or Xena back then I remember those were playing in Singapore and Malaysia and also like um there are Japanese animes and there are like yeah. kung fu movies from Hong kung Kong movies. yeah this right how do people role play is it uh, do you think it's quite uh, distinct uh, to them it depends um a lot of the english language groups i've played there are a lot of similarities with the groups that i've seen when i was in university in the us uh you have pop culture references maybe fewer references to things like monty python um and more references to like you know wong fei hong or fong sai yok from the kung fu movies or even you know the occasional dance sequence where someone draws upon imagery from a bollywood movie because you get indian um pop popular culture bleeding into malaysia malaysia you know being a multicultural co- country with you know malay muslims and chinese and indian and uh, uh, a smaller uh ethnicities uh, uh indigenous groups all over the place so you, when you were role playing in english a lot of it sort of follows a general similar general pattern when we get together in person it tends to be in these uh game shops game cafes now malaysia has a great food culture and so food uh, you will find people eating you know pringles or nachos at the table but you'll eat just as easily find people eating prawn crackers or some uh a uh, rojak salad or some skewers of meat you know satay uh and there are 24 hour mcdonalds in the klang valley and other areas where gamers will meet up and just you'll see them pulling up and playing magic the gathering or catan or dnd uh for as long as they can hang on to that table and just buy a few cokes and burgers that happens too uh food culture the whole idea that you know after you play at an RPG 
you might want to take your new players out to get a bite somewhere. That's very true in Malaysia. We'll go out to one of those uh, Muslim Indian mamaks and get some roti chanai uh, or some fried noodles and some sweet tea and just hang out and talk about what happened in the game. That happens just as much in Malaysia. This is a matter of lifestyle, isn't it? Your food is very important to you guys. Usually a lot of like uh, recreation and other like activities revolve around food and things like that. Uh, do food get involved in the role play? Uh, do people talk about what sort of food they uh, cook during adventuring or in while they are camping, you know, at night uh, as they are keeping watch? The... Uh, not any, I don't think any more or less than in RPGs in the U.S., uh, I don't think so. I mean, occasionally you'll get someone who thinks themselves a George R. R. Martin and loves to describe feasts, but I don't think that the, the describing food and making it part of the game, it's not necessarily a bigger, a bigger deal. But I will say that um, I am glad to see that when... Uh, I, I'm always glad to see when someone describes, say, uh, Asian culture in a role-playing game and includes uh, elements about the, the food and the... And and, and uh, the the delicacies involved. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you said uh, you know, you like to see some more you know like Asian culture involved in D and D, but you know like the monk, it's pretty much you know you can really just call it a an Asian culture that's involved, isn't it? Very stereotypical uh, Shaolin monk type thing. Uh, there are a lot of RPGs with, that treat uh, martial arts differently like the old Weapons of the Gods and uh, the, the, what was it called? The, the, the one after Warriors of the Gods, uh, something of the Wulin. Um, they took a very different approach to uh, martial arts. And there is a lot about, um, there's a lot about Asian, about Asian culture and Malaysian culture that's not tied into just one kind of thing. There's beliefs about ghosts and spirits. We could get into those. Um, yeah, uh, there's martial arts. There's there's a local there's lo- local martial arts like Punjab Silat. If you watch the movie The Ray, you've seen Silat in action. It's a really vicious martial art, and that I've seen you know some RPGs like Knights of Black Agents, and I think GURPS may have adapted it, but it's it's not ever been as big a thing as say uh, Kung Fu or Karate. I have been checking out some uh, Malaysian Facebook groups and like perhaps you know other groups. It seems that you know, there is a bit of like an industry in Malaysia, isn't it? People are creating board games in Malaysia, so there is a bit of an industry there. So, and I see some are reviewed in your own blog. You know, would it be a, only a matter of time until people started creating tabletop RPGs in Malaysia, or maybe there are already some? There are there are a couple of uh, of games. Uh, I really want to point out a thousand thousand islands, which is a RPG source book project. It's uh, sort of intended for things like OSR, D&D type gaming, but it's pretty systemless. It's created as a set of zines by a couple of uh, local creators, Mun Kao, the artist who does amazing artwork and has a Patreon to support his support this research into Southeast Asian cultural fantasy. And uh, ZX Yu, um, the writer, who has uh, come up with some really creative bits of adventuring in Southeast Asian milieu, on his Tumblr, and they put together these zines, which we're going to be reviewing in the near future, that cover towns filled with uh, cats that live alongside humans, uh, crocodiles that rule over humans, and uh, stories of the ghost traditions of uh, Southeast Asian milieu, and uh, just lots of assorted artwork from Munkau. And the biggest thing about... um, I think the most interesting thing about the monsters of uh, a Malaysian fantasy RPG setting or D&D setting would be the hantu, the uh, ghosts and spirits, which come across all of the different cultures here. All right. So this is another lifestyle question because, you know, I know people in Hong Kong, they said, you know, work is really crushing them. And, you know, they sometimes, you know, they work even longer hours than people in Japan. And... Mm, Sometimes you know, they only have the time to play tabletop RPG through forums or uh, by email. That sort of like tabletop RPG player. How is a work-life balance in Malaysia? Do people have enough time to play there? Well, in, I have to get into specifics because 
when I was in the U.S., I could see there's a higher percentage of working class people who will still join in D&D games. But in Malaysia, it seems to be that it's more middle class people that have more of the opportunity and the exposure to RPGs. So you're dealing with people who work in law, in uh, corporate structures, uh, programmers. I've met uh, CEOs and uh, uh, people working in the diplomatic corps who role play. So, and, but Malaysia has a growing middle class and there's an increasing opportunity now, especially with a lot more people getting online. Like almost everyone gets online and finds out about role playing games. They have the opportunity, opportunity to. So, um, and a lot of people in the middle class, they find themselves, they may be overworked, there may be a strong culture to, of uh, work comes first and you're going to have to cancel out of a game. I've seen that a lot of times. There are some companies, and this is probably true elsewhere, where if the company has a little a, uh, anniversary dinner or uh, a boss is uh, inviting everyone to come and drink, you have to go. And that means you miss out on a game or you show up at my game, game session two hours late, missing your character sheet and smelling of vodka. That happens too. Um, but yeah, that is one of the things that the Adventurous League coordinator was telling me. Gray was telling me that um, he noticed that uh, in, uh, because of this work culture, you have difficulty to commit to longer campaigns. And so it's a bit harder to get a regular group together. When you can get a regular group together, you hang on to it tight as you can. There are some people who've been running one-shots, like me and some other folks, and that's been an opportunity to try different uh, systems powered by the Apocalypse or Blades in the Dark-type games, uh, Honey Heist, the one-pager by uh, Grant Howitt, stuff like that. And some of the same people that in my circle, they also have been creating their own mini-games. Mini uh, I know a guy who is hacking the Monster Hearts 2 engine to do the social conflict and drama that you would see in Crazy Rich Asians, specifically Crazy Rich Asians. There's a guy who's uh, done a one-page role-playing game about robots making nukes in a factory who discover their own emotions and their own sentience uh, called Hello World. That's by my friend Ben. And uh, I'm working on a uh, small uh, RPG micro game about detectives furry detectives in a noir future, sort of a darker Zootopia type thing. Tabletop RPG community, do you find it's easier to get uh, college students or do you find uh, even younger players uh, who can start There's to play a, or know, high school people or is it mostly uh, a hobby that older people get into? Um, when you pl There are older players who keep coming back to it and so I'm really glad to say, see that with uh, D&D 5th edition especially, there is a wave of younger college age and 20s uh, players. And um, when we have had uh, demos at conventions and on the road, we've seen families interested in bringing their teenage kids in to try and play. But trying out and being exposed doesn't mean that, they'll, that we retain them. I'm, it's more likely to find someone saying that, oh, my kid is now you know, 12, I'm going to teach him D&D, &D, or uh, what's the youngest that I can get a, um, uh, my nephew to learn RPGs? Oh, is four too young? That kind of thing happens. Uh, so, yeah, I would say it's still really uh, college age and up that really start getting into it and start uh, looking at what they can download or buy. But the number of outlets that you can actually buy the books at is pretty limited. The Adventurous League guys tried to get Wizards of the Coast to bring in books because we already have a lot of magic shops and all these shops are already buying from Wizards. So could we also get them to bring in retail copies of the Player's Handbook and the DMG and the Monster Manual, at least get started. But for all those years that they were trying, Wizards never really put the focus because we're a niche market. It was even difficult to get the Star Wars Edge of the Empire RPG in because of uh, Asmodee taking over Fantasy Flight games and the Asian license was not renewed for a couple of years. So only recently have they brought the FFG RPGs officially into Malaysia. Before that, you had to buy them through Amazon or something. So a lot of people who want to get any RPG other than D&D &D will have to go through Amazon. If they want to get D&D, &D, there are a few comic shops that carry it. There were bookstores like uh, Borders Books and Kinokinia would bring in books 
as far back as D and D fourth edition and uh, Pathfinder, they were carrying stocking some books, but these are bookstore owners, so they don't really the bookstore staff don't really care about what's a core book. So you might have Player Handbook two and three from fourth edition, but you'll never see the first the, fir the first original Player Handbook ever again. Um, and you might have stores that bring in a whole bunch of Pathfinder books, but forget to bring in the core book. That happens. So it's a it's much more likely that it's someone who is able to get a credit card and get online and say, hey, I can buy um, the player's handbook or I can order a couple of these books. Uh, and the shipping, if you're getting something from the U.S., is pretty high. So sometimes you get a group buy, a whole bunch of people saying, oh, uh, Waterdeep Dungeon he Dragon Heist is coming out, uh, but it's cheaper on shipping if four of us get together and do a group buy. And for a while, people were doing dice that way before... More recently, dice have become suddenly available through uh, online retailers, Lazada, and so on, uh, getting dice from Chinese suppliers on the cheap. So only recently, dice have become much more available here. And Malaysia is much better than a lot. Malaysia has a much higher GDP and generally has a, it's got an economy that's running better than some of its neighbors. And still, we have a great deal of difficulty in expanding role playing out of a uh, middle class niche. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's very fascinating. Do you have any insight on why that is? Um well, uh books are expensive to get here. Honestly, even uh tabletop uh tabletop board games are expensive, but um some uh during the Euro game craze, we had uh, game cafes coming up and renting out the board games so people could play them and uh, play them at their tables and learn about it and just pay a small fee and then they would start selling the euro games on their shelves. You had a there's a the one of the uh, the, the biggest boss in the market, uh, Meeples, has a direct uh, distribution deal with people like Asmodee, so they get a lot of the board games uh, in and can afford to sell them at a reasonable price. It's still not cheap to buy uh, board games, uh, Euro games. Uh, it's not, it, there, there's a official Warhammer stores that opened up in Malaysia. And so Warhammer 40,000 is an extremely expensive hobby, but um, there are still people who play it. Because of the, uh, because of the uh, volume and the margin for Magic Cards, uh, Warhammer 40,000, uh, Settlers of Catan and other Euro games, it's worthwhile for the stores to make the effort. But with D&D &D and other RPGs, you have maybe one or two people who have the books, and if you just have it split up between a player book and the core and all the other rules and the monster books, maybe just the GM or the DM will have the monster books. So, And you'll have a circle of you know six people, most of whom don't buy the game. And it's the economical thing about role-playing that you can get so much game out of one book for so many people who don't have to pay for it. Um, but it's also really hard to get the retailers interested because of that. You know, this kind of also raises the question, how would a local game publisher in Malaysia compete in this sort of environment? How would they be able to make a profit out of their creation? There's game designers who... There's another group which is also... Uh, uh, administered by some of the same people. Uh, the, the, the guy, Gray, the guy who did um, Adventures League, also put together a tabletop, this uh, tabletop designer group on Facebook, which I'll link you later. And you have people talking about card games and uh, board games. There are a lot of local tabletop designers interested in making these, especially the kind of uh, glossy card games and nice-looking board games that you can sell to overseas markets, and so you're dealing with people who are interested in something different, something maybe with an Asian flavor, uh, and uh, yeah, when you aim at the whole Eurogame market, you've got a bigger chance, but if you're just looking at the local market alone, um, you're, it's, it's, it's going to be too small of a niche, really. Um, there are, a lot of the RPG designers come from the homebrew tradition of just making their own uh, settings and their own rules, and just you know playing them here. You have people like um, there's a guy called Robertson Sondo who has made, as far as I know, one of the only Malay language role playing games 
called uh, Savage Flower Kingdom or Karaja An Bunga Ganas. And that's a very simple uh, sort of a a very sort of simple sort of a mini system uh, with uh, tactical rules, which could be quite flexible for doing sci-fi or fantasy. And you have you know people who do very uh, you have people who who do a few other uh, RPG systems, but it's just you know for the sake of creating their own RPG system and trying it out. And right now, publishing hasn't really been a thing apart from, like I said, the guy who the guys who put together their zines and mail them out to individuals who are interested uh, all around the world uh, from uh, their from from their this little place in uh, I think in uh, Port Dixon uh, uh, in the state of Suriname. So yeah, you're going to be small press, and if you're making an RPG, then the good news is that. You just, it's as easy as putting something together and putting it on uh, DMs Guild, which I know some guys who do artwork uh, for DMs Guild products uh, or publish you know, stuff through uh, via PDF. You could try striking a deal with uh, someone who does print-on-demand like DriveThruRPG. Uh, but if you're going to make your own game and print it locally and then send it out, that you're looking at a very uh, steep slope to climb. There's local board game people who will do that with uh, printers who will print, you know, a thousand print run, printing cards, printing boards. There's even people who make resin models uh, for their uh, board games. And I know for, sh for a fact that there's plenty in Singapore that do the same. There was a very successful Kickstarter called, I think, uh, uh, South China Sky or something like that, uh, that had sky ships battling over kingdoms, a board game, and uh, they're fulfilling that now. There, one of the guys I know on Facebook sent back pictures to this big uh, convention in Singapore where he met with a whole bunch of Singaporean board game developers. Something you should look at as well. Yeah, yeah, that sounds really fascinating. It's like, uh, I think to a lot of people, a lot of my viewer, maybe it's a like, whole different side of an industry that they don't know of from the other side of the world. So it would be great to have a look at it, all those different games, how it's done differently by different people. And, um, you know, in general, in terms of, like, tabletop RPGs, uh, do you think it would be, uh, would you prefer to see uh, Wizard of the Coast stepping up their game uh, to try to make Dungeons & Dragons more accessible in Malaysia, or do you prefer to see, uh, you know, other games uh, coming in and maybe, uh, you know, like, yes, just create a whole different sort of industry in Malaysia? Well, I'm, uh, I'm someone who's already played a lot of D&D, and I'm a lot more interested in other RPGs. But I will say that the whole idea of Dungeons & Dragons is taking this kitchen sink of so many different cultures and uh, references from so many different mythologies and just shoving them together. And Malaysia is also kind of this great big kitchen sink mix of different cultures, but we could do just as easily with some other system that we made at home that could fulfill the same function. In fact, knowing how gamers have different interests, there'll be different kinds of games. There'll be story games for people who like that. There'll be an OSR version that takes into account that uh, measuring armor class is not really an option in the sweaty tropics. You know, There'll be different ways of telling uh, Malaysian and Southeast Asian stories through RPGs that don't have to full go through the D&D, uh, &D, uh, go through D&D. &D. That said, you know, there are a few bits that do make it into RPGs. Uh, there's famous local monsters like the Penanggalan, a, the uh, monster who flies off a woman's head with a uh, stomach and intestines dangling below, fl floating through the night and feeding on the blood of newborns and uh, new mothers, uh, and then returning back to integrate with the body during the daytime. So it's not technically undead. The Penanggalan has been in D&D since 1981 when it first appeared in the Fiend Folio, and it's been standed up up to 3rd edition. It hasn't appeared in 5th edition, and I think it would be really cool if the Penanggalan showed up again. It has appeared in other RPGs, like Legend of the Five Rings, uh, Knights Black Agents, and I think Pathfinder Bestiary 3 has the Penanggalan as well. There's a lot of uh, this ghost tradition, Chinese hungry ghosts, there's uh, all kinds of uh, things which are actually living part of the culture. People, on one hand, they're modern people, they're God-fearing, they follow religions like Islam and Christianity and 
uh, in some cases, these preclude beliefs in these traditional stories of ghosts and monsters. But for a lot of people, it's a real thing. When someone in your family gets sick and says he feels a presence after going through this uh, remote jungle area or taking a shortcut through a cemetery, you take it seriously. And you might get the guy, uh, you, you might bring a Taoist exorcist or a bomo, a, uh, a shaman, to uh, help protect the guy from the influence of this, these spirits. Like superstition is part and parcel of daily life in Malaysia, isn't it? it it's, it's a thing where uh, we're a pretty modern country, but we still pay heed to old stories. And there are a lot of uh, people, a lot of communities where it's a part of their lives and it is something to pay attention to and to to take the appropriate measures, uh, the uh, rituals, the ceremonies, and uh, follow certain taboos, while at the same time you're living in a modern society. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's literally a part of people's lives. And a lot of people in Asia still burn offerings for the hungry ghosts if they're Chinese, and they still uh, will consult uh, spiritualists uh, depending on which culture and which tradition they follow. There's a lot of that as well. It's, it's two layers. And if you were to create a fantasy, modern urban fantasy RPG, you want to take that into consideration. Zidik Siu is one of the, uh, uh, one of the stretch goal writers for this modern horror RPG called Demon City, which was recently kickstarted. And he is adding in Southeast Asian style ghosts and supernatural material and that, I think that's really cool. And just uh, one final thing. This is the question I always ask all my interviewees. Can you give us your special tip, your secret sauce to give uh, your players a great time? Well, uh, the secret sauce, the GMing secret sauce for me is the secret sauce is made of the players. It's what people bring to the table. I want to try and consider what things in a role-playing game they like, whether they like to act out and inhabit their character, whether they like to sort of take a step back and help to, uh, to add story elements uh, from an author stance, if they like to hack and slash, if they like to number crunch their characters. And I try to make sure that the group is integrated well enough that they fit together. There are some times when someone won't fit as well as they would into a different group, but I take into consideration what they want, and I try to make sure the RPG is about their characters, that I'm not coming up with, um, you know, I'm coming up with a plot that they interact with, but the ending is up to them. The outcomes and what happens, it's really about their characters, their side stories, and their uh, backgrounds that get integrated into the plot. And for me, that's really important. And bringing that together, bringing Bringing that to the players is also part of my uh, my goal with the blog. I'm planning to try and bring more new role players in by adding a whole series of how we role play articles in 2019, advocating and uh, educating people about RPGs. And that was Kai from Malaysia. You can check out his blog and some Malaysian Facebook D&D group through the link below. Before I end the video, let me give thanks to my Patreon supporters for supporting this series. If you like what I'm doing, consider joining Patreon so that you can also ask questions to our future interviewee. Subscribe to the channel and remember to click on future videos so that you can open the world map as we explore tabletop RPG cultures from all around the world. CJ, over and out.